the name Rowan Adhamdani doesn't sound like your typical American name. So I'm often asked, where are you from? I say Libya, and since most people don't know where that is, I have to further explain that Libya is in Africa. Saying Africa changes how everybody sees me and sees where I'm from. Once a boy in my brother's class asked him if we rode lions and lived in caves in Africa. <laughs> and adults and children alike are always surprised when we show them pictures from our summer trips. It's like everybody is thinking, this is Africa? You see, certain areas on this earth are surrounded by a myth, the myth of the third world. Sometimes a specific country will be given this designation. Sometimes a whole continent, like Africa, will fall prey to this labeling. And sometimes an area within a country will have to deal with the ramifications of being considered third world or developing. Appalachia is that area in America. The concept of the third world today is a little different than what it was at its creation. The history of the terminology is discussed in a 2012 Third World Quarterly article, so it's aptly named for this talk, by Solars at the University of Warsaw. And this is how the story goes. There's a French scholar, Alfred Savy, in 1952. He wants to create a term that will describe these countries that are overthrowing their colonizers. These countries had unique socioeconomic and political circumstances, and in coining the term third world, Savi was also alluding to the fact that these countries would have to follow a third path to enter the international stage as equals alongside older governments. Additionally, his paper took into account how these new countries weren't on either side of the Cold War conflict. So, how did this term transform over time? By the 1960s, only a decade after the creation of the term, it had become synonymous with underdeveloped. And by the 1970s, the term's political nuances on international relations had been dropped. The third and third world became denoted a hierarchical structure in which these countries were on the bottom. It's not a surprise, then, that in the rising political tensions of the Cold War, the connotations of the numbered world stuck as first place, second place, and last place. Republic or democratic, often Western countries, were considered first world countries. The communist nations were considered second world nations. And everyone else was third world. This covers the Middle East, Africa, Pacific Island nations, Central and Southern Amer South America. That's two thirds of the world's population. Thus, the term third world became a method of lumping a diverse collection of people into one category, people who were deemed insignificant in the greater power struggle. Yes, West Virginia is in the United States, which is clearly a th first world superpower. But internally within this country, are we really treated any differently than third world countries? Politically, there are big blue states big red states, swing states, and then everyone else. In 2016, two-thirds of the campaign events for the, for the presidential election took place in only six states. Florida, North Carolina, Pennsylvania, Ohio, Virginia, and Michigan. That means that out of 399 campaign events, 273 were in six states. NPR used information from Contour Media to make a new map for the presidential elections, scaling the size of states based on how much money they received from outside groups for political ads. There are only 12 states on this map, and of course, West Virginia is not one of them. <laughs> Economically, there are a select few powerhouse economies, some rising economies, and then everyone else. In a May 2018 ranking by U.S. News & World Report, West Virginia was put at spot 49, based on business environment, employment, and growth. 
I mean, and how important is a state really if some people in America don't even realize it's a state? <laughs> I've, I've been traveling before, and when you're bored out of your mind in an airport, an airplane, and your phone's dying, you've got to talk to the people that are sitting beside you. <laughs> and the, one of the first questions that comes up is, where are you from? I say, West Virginia, and I've had this happen at least twice, where people will correct me and say, you mean Western Virginia? <laughs> and it plays out like this no matter how we cut it. In the eyes of most Americans, places like rural West Virginia and minority communities, which exist all over this nation, probably matter as much to them as distant Libya. Despite being viewed as insignificant, most people have still made up their minds about what we're like. If you search Appalachian people online, the terms inbreeding, poverty, and backwards all come up as suggestions created by the search engine. The mere existence of these stereotypes is a form of social oppression for Appalachians because they are viewed as a part of Appalachia, as if the universe doesn't operate on cause and effect. For example, Poverty in Appalachia can be traced back to the entrance of timber and mining companies in the late 1800s. These companies would come into an area, force or trick farmers off of their land, and then once the farmers didn't have anything to do, they would work for the company for minimal pay in dangerous conditions. Once the companies had drained the resources of the areas, they would get up and leave, leaving behind unemployment, sickness, and an area that didn't even benefit from its own natural resource. As a related side note, doesn't that sound eerily similar to the history of resource exploitation in Africa and Central and South America, some of the highest concentrations of third world countries in the world? What about the inbreeding stereotypes? For this stereotype, it's not exactly known how it forms. Some believe that the companies that entered the area were trying to vilify Appalachians in order to justify ill treatment. So they spread some rumors. Others think that newcomers to the area couldn't fathom how such isolated communities could grow without inbreeding. But either way, anthropologist Robert Tincher in 1980 studied 140 years' worth of marriages in Appalachia to determine if there was truly a higher rate of intermarriage in these populations. The results? Compared with those that have been reported for populations elsewhere, or at earlier periods in American history, Appalachian intermarriage values were neither unique or extreme enough to justify labeling Appalachians as incestuous. Now repeat this search for any other third world or developing area, and you will see the similarities. In fact, that third world quarterly article I mentioned earlier the author talks about how the third in third world brings to mind the adjectives backward, underdeveloped, marginalized, and just plain worse. Those sound really similar to the words generated by our search engine for the Appalachian people we searched earlier. There seems to be a single narrative for these areas of the world. We're forgotten, we're underestimated, and we're stamped with baseless stereotypes. The myth of the third world allows a region and its people to be wholly dismissed, if not because of where they're from, then because of who they inherently are. True, we do have many problems of our own. No one's denying that. But where in the first world do you find culture and tradition surviving not as relics in a museum, but lived and carried on? We have powerful family relationships in a time period where the traditional family unit is falling apart elsewhere. In 2012, the National Marriage Project was headed by W. Bradford Wilcox at the University of Virginia. This project studied how American marriages formed and ended, but maybe most importantly, how they affected society. You see, what happens in the family doesn't stay in the family. And the 2012 report on marriage in America explained to us Marriage is not merely a private arrangement. It's also a complex social institution. 
Marriage fosters small cooperative unions, also known as stable families, that enable children to thrive, shore up communities, and help family members to succeed during good times and to weather the bad times. I wonder how our community, one of the hardest hit by the opioid epidemics in the nation, would have fared without the community support that's built around generations of family empathy and love. Why are the positive traits in our community, if not related to money and political power, seen as less? The problem is when we begin to play into these negative narratives. Is it easier for us to blame our failures on where we come from and not what we did? Do our successes sound better when we say we came from a place like West Virginia? Do we make it sound as if our successes are only the result of individual talent, and have nothing to do with our support systems. We can change how people view our homes by actively challenging stereotypes through our actions, by avoiding sensationalism when describing our communities, by calling out jokes or backhanded compliments told at the expense of our people, and by never being ashamed of where we're from. Because in the end, we can't expect anybody to respect where we're from if we're not proud of our origins. I was often the first Muslim and Libyan or African somebody met. And over the years, I've compiled at least four truths of fighting stereotypes. The first two you've probably heard. Number one, people think you're the exception. Number two, no matter how much you think you've proven yourself, there are always naysayers. Now, number three is one I dealt with a lot. People have exaggerated ideas about what your life is like or how different you are. On the topic of religion, my peers would always ask me what we did for holidays, like they expected it was something really exotic. But the truth is, there's a common theme when humans celebrate holidays. We eat, we dress up, we give gifts, and there's some kind of art form or creative element involved. Maybe it's music or something odd, like who can make the ugliest Christmas sweater. <laughs> now, now, family is probably the topic people like to exaggerate the most for me. My peers always thought that they knew what my home life was like, and it was the oddest, oddest situation. I remember once, my freshman year of high school, I was telling a funny story about my parents, who are very funny people. They're right here in the crowd. <laughs> and this boy, after I finished telling the story, turns to me and he says, I didn't expect your parents to be like that. Now, this boy has never met my family in his life. I didn't even know him at that time. I told him, like what? He said, I didn't expect your parents to joke around with you. I thought they'd be really strict and tough. Or when I decided to go into med school, everybody started implying, adults and my peers, started implying that I was being forced to go into med school. But didn't assume that for any of my other classmates. It was just me. The people that didn't know me always assumed I didn't have a support system at home. On the stereotype of family life, I could have played into those negative narratives. It would have gotten me some pity, People would have thought I was really strong under the weight of my parents' harsh expectations. But the truth is, I would have harmed minorities more in the long run, because the minorities that followed me would have had to deal with the, mis the increased misinformation of our community. And I would have succeeded in solidifying that mainstream stereotype into somebody's own personal story that they tell at every Thanksgiving as evidence for some kind of international culture debate at the table. Yeah. I knew a girl who. <laughs> now, the fourth truth of fighting stereotypes is that minorities are always battling uphill. We can't just defend Appalachians, we have to defend everybody. We can't want society to treat us as equals, to give us equal opportunity, to not count us out as soon as we walk in or as soon as they hear our accents, but still utilize biased thinking with others. For example, what kind of credibility do you have shooting down jokes about lazy hillbillies when you don't bat an eye at a joke about an immigrant? 
What this involves, of course, is heavy introspection. And recognizing the biases we have, both conscious and subconscious, isn't easy. We're fed stereotypes our whole lives, from our communities, from the news that reports differently based on race, and from the TV shows that use that same storyline for the one minority character on each of their sets. Stereotypes perpetuate stereotypes, even if they're not about the same group. Because when society normalizes the practice of using one idea to describe a complex whole, the stereotyping continues on as a chain. It never stops at just one group. We're only third world when we let others define what it means to be progressive. But the reality is, there are no first worlds or third worlds. We're just a different world, built on values that, despite the many issues we face, continue to hold us together. Values that more and more each day this world is so desperately in need of. Perhaps our first world counterparts should take some notes from us. Thank you. <laughs>